Looming 110 feet above the Potomac River, 35 miles northwest of Washington, is Ball's Bluff, today one of the NVRPA's most picturesque and peaceful sites. But on October 21st, 1861, in the opening months of the Civil War, a violent clash between Union and Confederate forces erupted here, shattering the morning calm and lasting until midnight. The day began as a routine Union reconnaissance, but the fog of war and faulty intelligence forced untested soldiers into action. What happened here was an early war skirmish that was really just an accident. Some Union troops came across in small skiffs. Reconnaissance patrol, typical, come out and see what's going on, happens on the night of October 20th, 1861. These inexperienced early war soldiers see a row of trees in the distance. It's nighttime, moonlight shadows. They think that row of trees is a collection of Confederate tents. They think of it as a camp. Without checking it out, they go back and report to their commanding officer that they have found a Confederate camp that looks to be unguarded. Union General Charles Stone on the Maryland side of the Potomac organized a raiding party to attack the Confederate camp. He sent 300 men across the swollen Potomac. When the raiding party discovered there was nothing to raid, it again sent word back to General Stone. They send over some reinforcements to turn the raiding party into a larger reconnaissance. While all of that is going on, some Confederate pickets in the area bump into the Federals who are out there and they begin fighting. Each side comes to understand that something is going on at Ball's Bluff and each side begins to send more troops over and the whole thing evolves into an unintended, unplanned battle. Lasts all day. The men fighting that day for the North and the South were citizen soldiers, soft from their civilian lives. Here, you had a situation in which uh, everyone was inexperienced. None of the federal troops had ever been under fire before. Some of the Confederates had participated peripherally at First Manassas three months before. But by and large, we're talking two inexperienced groups of men. Uh, they did the best they could. It was a hard fight, small in numbers, about 1,700 on each side. But it was, for that, uh, for that time period, something that was pretty drastic for all of these guys. They had never done anything like this before. The Federals had the Confederates outgunned with their modern rifles and artillery. But handicapped by inexperience, they could not seize the advantage. Most of the Federals here had rifled muskets. Um, most of the Confederates had older smoothbores, but given the ranges at which this battle was fought, it really didn't make any difference. We have three cannon on the field, all of which were brought over by the Federals. All ended up being captured by the Confederates at the end of the day. Behind me is the, the main portion of the battlefield, a couple of companies of a unit known as the 1st California tangled with a portion of the 8th Virginia at the top of the slope. Both sides soon fell back, but not for long. The Confederates rallied and pushed their advance with the 18th Mississippi in the lead. And you can imagine two lines of troops marching down, coming right across the field, getting slammed by Federal line. The 8th Virginia launched an attack late in the day, capturing two Federal cannon before falling back again and then the final climactic action of the day involved the fresh troops of the 17th Mississippi came and ultimately broke the federal line. That resulted in a rout. The Federals fell back down the southern end of the bluff down some very steep terrain. They did not, as you will sometimes read, jump off the bluff. The Federals may have had superior weapons, but the Southerners knew the lay of the land. It was the Confederates' use of the terrain that won them the day. This area was open, so a lot of the federal casualties were caused by the fact that these men were simply out in the open and had no cover. Federals eventually suffered some 223 killed, about 226 wounded, some 553 prisoners. The Confederates suffered 36 killed, about 264 wounded, and three prisoners. One of the interesting things about the battle is the death of the Union commander, Colonel Edward Baker, who was a United States senator and the best friend of President Lincoln. He is the only U.S. senator ever to die in battle. 
Ball's Bluff is primarily interesting because it was unplanned. You see a lot of the amateurishness and disorganized aspects of the fighting that you would get early in the war, things that you wouldn't have seen later. While this battle had little military importance, the political aftermath had a major impact. In the wake of the stinging defeat at Ball's Bluff, the Republican Congress, looking for a scapegoat, created the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, relieved General Stone of his command, ordered him locked up for six months, and then began plotting against those generals it regarded as less than aggressive. The result created a distrust among the Union general staff that harmed the war effort. The disaster at Ball's Bluff is a battle of two armies gathered to fight for no reason other than having been brought together by circumstance and place, the result of a small-scale scouting mission gone awry and military leadership that lacked experience and competence. It was October 21st. 1861 when an advance party of officers and men from a 19th Massachusetts commanded by Captain Rice's of Company, F, crossed the Potomac River in boats, called scows, ahead of the main army to Harrison's Island. In the fog, they saw a field with row upon row of enemy tents. They immediately informed their superiors. Baker directed his troops to cross the Potomac, ferried in small scows procured from local farmers. On the Virginia side, the soldiers took a narrow car path up the wooded, rock-encrusted slope off Ball's Bluff. The rows of tents turned out to be little more than farmers' haystacks. But when a small northern force encountered southern cavalry and infantry outside Leesburg, the battle was joined. A detail from Company F was sent out on picket duty during the night after the battle, under command of Lt. J.G.C. Dodge who found a narrow path along the shore of the island, on which he posted his men at the usual intervals. No one could approach without being seen, and the river, on its surface, would show any boat or moving object. As the pickets were being placed, the voices of men were heard, and several were seen running toward the bivouac of the 19th. Lieutenant Dodge chased and hailed them, but they would not stop until he threatened to shoot. They said they had just crossed from the Virginia side in a small boat. The lieutenant tried to get two or three of them to row back again, and rescue some of their wounded comrades on the other hand, but no one would venture. For those of us who don't know what a picket is, it's an advance outpost or guard for a large force, was called a picket. Ordered to form a scattered line far in advance of the main army's encampment, but within supporting distance, a picket guard was made up of a lieutenant two sergeants, four corporals, and forty privates from each regiment. Picket duty constituted the most hazardous work of infantrymen in the field. Being the first to feel any major enemy movement, they were also the first liable to be killed, wounded, or captured. And he most likely targets of snipers. Picket duty, by regulation, was rotated regularly in the regiment. During the night Lt. Dodge asked for more men as pickets, and a detail from Company H, under command of Lt. Hale, was sent out, completing the line along the shore. It was a terrible night for those on picket. The wounded on the Virginia side of the river, cut off from all help, could plainly be heard crying for water, and begging that a boat be sent over to them. Now and then one could be heard, as he waded out into the water, and, with strong and steady strokes, breasted the current. Little by little his strokes became weaker, then less steady, then mere splashes, in the frantic endeavor to hold out. Then a gurgling sound, a cry for help, and all was still again. All this passed under the senses of willing comrades, powerless to give aid. Now and then, one who was more successful would creep, cold, benumbed and almost dead, up the bank. October 21st, 1861. During that night, Lt. Dodge, in making the round of his pickets had heard a voice from the Virginia shore, calling, send over an officer under a flag of truce, to look after your dead and wounded. He reported this to Colonel Hinks, and was himself detailed for the duty at 10 o'clock in the morning. Some fugitives had secured a skiff on the Virginia side, and had reached the island, and in this skiff Lt. Dodge was rowed across by private car of Company F, who volunteered for the duty. 
the lieutenant borrowed a white handkerchief from adjutant John C. Chadwick his own being black and tied it to a ramrod. The little lieutenant, as he went over in the skiff on the important mission, was dressed in a pair of private's trousers, turned up at the bottom, a pair of old army shoes, a blouse with shoulder straps, sword and revolver. A dirty, ragged, gray blanket was thrown over his shoulders like a shawl and his glazed cap cover hid the bugle on the front of the cap. No real insignia of his rank appeared in sight. A fine, wet, drizzle served to make matters gloomier than they otherwise would have been, and the little skiff was borne downstream by the current. The bank, where the lieutenant landed was strewn with the tins from cartridge boxes, broken muskets, bits of uniforms, and one or two wounded men were calling for water. Here and there, rebels were seeking for spoil. In one place, four or five men were going through a knapsack or a dead soldier, it was not possible to tell which. One of them, the roughest looking of the lot, had a red U.S. blanket around him, and was hailed by Lieutenant Dodge with, I say, you fellow with the red blanket, where is the officer who called for a flag of truce? He's on the bluff somewhere, I reckon, was the reply can you take me where I can find him, asked the lieutenant. Evidently moved by the idea that it might be a feather in his cap, to conduct a flag of truce, he consented. The bluff was steep and slippery and the lieutenant found it very difficult, with one hand holding the flag and the other his blanket, to surmount. The rebel escort, seeing his difficulty, politely assisted him, but when they reached the plateau at the top no officer was visible. He was here a short time ago and went in that direction, said one man who was standing at the top. The two men, rebel and yank, started off to hunt him up, but it seemed as if he had just left every spot they had just reached. Men in grey were in abundance, discussing the fight, but no officer could be seen. Civilians were joking with the rebel soldiers about the misfortunes of the Union troops, and Negro slaves were coming up with horses to bury the southern dead. Soon a mounted officer rode by and the lieutenant inquired for a mounted officer, to receive the flag of truce. As the officer rode off, a rebel soldier, picking up a gun, asked the lieutenant, what kind of a thing it was. He was told that it was an Austrian rifle. What's this? He asked passing over another. That's an Enfield, was the lieutenant's reply. Well, this is the best, said the Inquisitor, patting a Springfield, if the damn the Yankees did make it. And then he offered the lieutenant a chaw of tobacco. While this conversation was progressing, a mounted officer appeared, and, in an insolent tone, said to Lieutenant Dodge, Aren't you a damn yank? I'm a Yankee, he responded. What do you want here? Lieutenant Dodge told the nature of his errand, but the officer seemed to doubt him. Several of the men, however, came to his aid, exclaiming, Oh, we know all about it. The adjutant of the 17th Mississippi called out for an officer to come over under a flag of truce, and we saw this officer come over. Where are your credentials? Asked the officer. I have none responded Lieutenant Dodge, in our army the word of an officer is sufficient. How in hell do we know you're an officer? Stepping on a small stone nearby, the lieutenant drew himself up to his full height five feet, three inches, jerked the blanket from his shoulders, and replied as gruffly as he could, pointing to his shoulder straps. There are my credentials and then turned his back upon the rebel officer, who rode away, growling, well, you ought to have credentials shortly after this. Lieutenant Dodge was met by Lieutenant Tyler, of the 7th Mississippi, who, during a friendly chat, damned the Yankee mudsill, very effectually. But the only Yankee present thought best, to let it pass. A mudsill is an unkind southern term for a Yankee, a lowlife. Soon he was informed that he was expected at Leesburg, and started for that town, with the rebel soldier, who had been his original guide him up the bluff. They had gone but a short distance, however, when they met Colonel Jennifer, formerly of the 2nd U.S. Dragoons. A guard was then placed over the lieutenant, and no conversation was allowed. My own idea, said Lieutenant Dodge later, was that this ought to have been done on my first arrival. Colonel Jennifer was very polite. He asked after his old friend, General Stone, and expressed his astonishment that the Union forces could have been such fools, 
as to have made the attack as they did, with everything against them. He said that the commander on the island could send over a reasonable number of men, not over a dozen, to bury the dead, that they would be placed under guard and not allowed to converse with the Confederates. Lieutenant Dodge returned to the island, and crossed again to the Virginia side with Captain Vaughn, of the Rhode Island Battery and 12 men, under orders from Colonel Hinks to prolong the work until nightfall. This they successfully did, although, suspecting something, the enemy at one time seized the little party, and threatened to hold them as prisoners of war because a rebel horseman, who was chasing a Union soldier, while the truce was on, was shot and killed by a man from Company H of the 19th, on the island. They were released, however, on the firm demand of Colonel Hinks. Toward night the burial party returned and as soon as Captain Vaughn had landed, he placed his arms around the neck of Lieutenant Reynolds, exclaiming horrible, horrible, and in this position the two walked for some distance toward headquarters, the captain relating the details of what he had seen and passed through during the day.